Well, we're back with another episode of Doable Discipleship. My name's Doug Jones. If you're new, we welcome you. I'm joined by my friend... Jason Wheeland, welcome, friends. If you're brand new, we just want to say, come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Was that? <laughs> uh, let me also add, as we kick off this brand new, fresh episode, as we do every Tuesday, uh, if you have been watching this show for a while, but you haven't told a friend about it yet... What, what do you... Wait, I mean, are you ashamed of us? Go ahead and do that. I'll even sweeten the pot. You recommend a friend, and both you and your friend can get the next 10 episodes for free. What? Doug, we didn't discuss this beforehand. <laughs> we need to let our sponsors know. <laughs> You're like the sit and sleep guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're killing me. You're ki- yeah. Was his name Larry? Ten episodes free. Yeah, it is Larry. Anyway, uh, yes, my yeah. name was Larry at one point on the show. Recommend a friend. Uh, recommend two friends. Don't forget, uh, every once in a while, we try to remind you: give us a rating or a review on iTunes. Give us a like on the video. Or just say hi in the comments. Yeah, and make sure you're subscribed to the channel, too. If you just stumbled onto Saddleback Church's YouTube channel, subscribe, hit the little bell thing so you can get some notifications for new stuff that Saddleback releases, which is lots of good stuff. Not just us, lots but of lots great of great stuff. things. Today is an especially sweet episode. We did an event recently, and we collected some question cards from the people who attended. These are theological questions. Uh, they kind of go all over the place. There's a variety tons of different questions and we didn't have time to answer them all at the event but we collected them we kept them and now we've got our good friend yeah you're interjecting well i was gonna say and we pulled some questions that you guys have asked oh yes that's true that's true yeah so you're you're represented here as well uh we got our good friend pastor tom holiday who's going to be joining us today the resident theological guru for saddleback and we are really excited to get some answers to some really interesting questions. Some of these are really, I think, thought-provoking they and are, fun. They are, definitely. Yeah, so we're looking forward to hearing what Tom has to say on these. We'll be right back. <music> Pastor Tom, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thanks great to have you back invite. on the show. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, we've got a bunch of great questions that have come in. Uh, from previous events that we've done and people who've written into the show and just kind of inquiring about a wide range of topics and things that are on there. Well, mind. and I, I told you guys one of my favorite things to do is answer doctrinal questions yeah. because some people think doctrine is boring, mm. and it can be. I understand that. But to me, doctrine is is doable discipleship. It's, yeah. it's life. It's how to do the life that God tells us to, to do. Yeah, It's just what what's... What's the organized way of explaining what the Bible says about this question? Yeah. How, how do I live that out? And that's exciting to me. Yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, these are questions that are, are, a lot of these come from people who have been wrestling unsuccessfully with these, and for some people, these might be little barriers that, that are kind of keeping them from a closer, more intimate relationship with Jesus. And so if we can get good yes. answers to those questions, then you might help someone unlock a, a deeper walk with Jesus, one that has... More well, trust. That's what we pray yeah. for. Yeah. And you know, I, I love to do this spontaneously. I yeah. told you guys. So I told <laughs> yes, you, yeah. don't send me the questions in advance. Yes, yes, yes. I just, yes, just yes. want to I want to hear them because I like to answer not out of, oh, let me go look at this theology book mm. and get all this together. I really want to answer how I would answer somebody in a conversation. Yeah. If they had this question. Yeah. We can affirm in advance. Pastor Tom has not <laughs> yeah. seen. He has questions. no knowledge of these questions. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit has, and he yes, is also exactly. here. <laughs> and I may have heard them before somewhere. You, I it's doubt possible. that there are too many surprises on this list. All right, well, let's jump in. I'll start us off with the first one. This one I think is actually pretty interesting. Was there a moment where Jesus learned and came to the realization that he was God, or do you think he always knew it? So was there a, a transitional that's, moment that's for him? That's an interesting question. In one sense, uh, he always knew it in mm. the core of his being, but also the Bible says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Mm. So he was born as a baby. So a, a baby doesn't even know words yet. Yeah. The, the humility of Jesus, that he allowed himself to be placed into a, the body of a human baby is just yeah. amazing to me. He had to learn to think, he had to learn to talk, he had to learn to walk, mm. and so... You think, okay, was there a moment, like as he's growing, that he all of a sudden it comes to him, like, you know, a, like a child clicks, all of a sudden yeah. it comes to him like, whoa, that's food. Mm-hmm. And they can figure that out and they can eat it. Was there a moment when Jesus was very, very young, oh, I'm, I'm God? Hmm. I don't know what that was. I do know uh, from the scriptures, Luke tells us uh, a story that tells me that by the age of 12, 
he knew that he was God. Yeah. You might remember the story of Jesus in the temple. Yeah. It's this amazing story. It's a longer answer. Since you asked it, I'm going to go no, and tell the story. Yeah, it. We like a this, thorough answer. There's this, <laughs> there's this experience that Jesus has where he goes with his family uh, uh, up to Jerusalem. Uh, they, I don't know if they went once a year, twice a year to celebrate Passover and some of the mm-hmm. other celebrations that they all mm-hmm. celebrate in Jerusalem. And they go up and they celebrate. And then they're going back home as a family, and they get a couple days out, and Joseph and Mary realize they've like lost Jesus. They left him back in Jerusalem. <laughs> Where's Jesus? Which is is the terror of every parent. Like, yeah. I I would like to say that Shondell and I never left one of our kids at church, yeah. but I can't say that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the reason we left one of our kids at church is the same thing that happened with Mary and Joseph. We would drive two cars to church. Yeah. So we would go home and we'd think that our child was with the other, other, other one. Yeah. Well, in that day, when you went uh, on a journey, usually the men traveled in one part of the caravan and the women mm-hmm. in the other. So they went up to Jerusalem, and Jesus is 12 at the time. At 12, a boy becomes a man. The the children traveled with the women, the men traveled with the with the men. So when Jesus is twelve and they're coming back, there there had to be this thought, most possibly, with, with Mary and Joseph. Mary's thinking, Well, he's gone on to be with Joseph. Isn't this awesome? He's a man now. Yeah. And Joseph's thinking, he's still with Mary. That's okay. Pretty soon he'll realize that he's a he's a man now. Yeah. They they compare notes and they realize we lost Jesus. Like they we lost, lost God. Emmanuel. They yeah. lost God, which is really not a good thing. So they so they rush back to Jerusalem to find Jesus, and they find him in the temple, and he's teaching the elders. And this amazing thing happens because at twelve, boy becomes a man. He starts to be with the men. He starts to be involved in his father's business. They say, Jesus, why weren't you with us? And he said, Didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? Hmm. So at that age jesus knew that his father is god yeah and at that age he understood something about himself that nobody else understood Mm -hmm. and he could teach the the teachers like nobody else could teach so i know it was at least by age 12 i think it was probably a lot earlier yeah he understood that he was god wow how's that for an answer that's an amazing (laughs) story to me it's one of my favorite stories in the scripture it is really is yeah and for every parent the most gut-wrenching like oh dang yeah All right, yeah, take you can't us away. just get on the intercom at Ralph's and be like, <laughs> yeah. Jesus. <laughs> um, all yeah. right, our next question says Did God feel human emotions and pain before Jesus came to die for my salvation? Well, yes. I mean, God feels all the emotions that we feel. The only reason we have human er- emotions is because God has those emotions. Hmm. So there's a real mistake that people make sometimes in thinking about Jesus coming to this earth and becoming a man. He's both God and man, Uh, 100% God, 100% man, 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. I know that's confusing math for us, but it's the truth of who he is. But we, we have this feeling sometimes that Jesus came, and because he lived as a man, now he can understand human emotion. That is not true. Right. Mm -hmm. The fact that he lived as a man helps us to know that he understands human emotion. Mm -hmm. But he understood human emotion even before he made man, even before there was a, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth, because all the emotions are from God. So Mm -hmm. the only reason we have emotions is because they're godly emotions. Mm -hmm. So he more than understood them beforehand. Mm. I, I even make my, myself, I make this mistake in sermons sometimes, saying Jesus came to earth so that he could understand us. Mm-hmm. And I have to catch myself and say, no, that's not true. He, mm. he already understood us. He's always understood us. He just came to let us know that he understands mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. So he knows our emotions better than we do. That's comforting to me, that no matter what emotion I'm, I'm having, he, he knows that emotion. Now, we can take that emotion to a place of sin or evil, which God has never mm-hmm. done. But God has the emotion even of anger. Hmm. We call it God's wrath. He never sins in that emotion. Hmm. We do. We turn it into bitterness or we turn it into hatred. But God has the emotion of wrath against all evil and what it does to his children, what it does to his creation. We have that emotion because God has that emotion. And so he understands that emotion better than we could Hmm. even imagine. Yeah. So it sounds like it's an origin response. It's that... that not that God had to assume human emotions, but that in creating human beings, he was giving his own emotions to other creatures. Right. It's part of our creation. Yeah. yeah. We're spiritually in the image of God. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Wow, that's great. Well, here's one that I think is just very pragmatic. I think it's very practical for people. It says, I'm a supervisor at work, but I don't really know how to start conversations with people about Christianity without offending them. Any suggestions? That is a good practical question. You guys might have some questions, some suggestions for this one as well. You know, where I think I'd start is um, don't try to have a conversation with them about Jesus first. Mm-hmm. Just have a conversation with them about their work, about their life. Get to know them as a person. And then naturally, the conversation about Jesus will flow. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes we feel such um, pressure to let make sure everybody that we know understands the truth because we're concerned about them. Yeah. We're concerned that if Jesus comes again, they're not going to be in heaven. We're, we're concerned if our, we get moved to another job, no one else is going to have this opportunity to share with them. Mm-hmm. But the truth of the matter is people come to faith not based on somebody who is like the professional witness who came in, like, you know, here I am, and I got five minutes, I'm going to share my faith with you, you want to know? That's not why people come to faith. They come to faith because they're loved Mm -hmm. by somebody, and that lets them know that they're loved by God, and that draws them into faith. Mm -hmm. So you start by talking about things that they're interested in, finding out what they're interested in, and prayerfully out of that, then they'll want to talk about some things that you're interested in. Mm. But it's interesting to me that even in talking about things that they're interested in, you know, let's talk about, you know, I love to fish, or uh, let's talk about I love to go to the movies, whatever it is, the Bible says as a Christian, you are a light mm. to the world. You are, you are salt. Yeah. And even in that kind of a conversation, something is happening in their mind where they're going, there's something different about this person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean you never share with them about Jesus, like that's enough. Mm. I'm just saying salt is happening, light is happening. They know something is different. So even in that first part of the conversation, there is a witness that's going on right. that's going to that's gonna lead to something yeah. in their lives. So I, I would just start with the things that are easiest to talk with them about. Yeah. Be, be a friend to them. Yeah. I don't know what you guys think about that one. Well, I think that... I think that we look at uh, the New Testament model that Paul gave of planting and watering and sort of tending yes. and then building to a harvest. Yeah, yeah. We plant, we water, but God causes the growth. Yeah. Instead of trying to rush to a conversion moment with somebody that you work with, um, maybe the place to begin with is start including them in your prayer life so that you begin at the spiritual level, you're beginning to cultivate the ground in this, in, in this very active spiritual way. Uh, and then as you're saying, just have seemingly mundane conversations with them that that begin building rapport and building relationship because it's from that place of relationship that shared faith is really going to spring forth from wouldn't you say i mean yeah so there's a there's a I, I would encourage anybody watching or listening to start by just um trying to trying to act and behave christianly before these people and engage right. in relationship with them and allow the holy spirit to guide the process forward knowing that there's no like there's no there's no good process for a microwave kind of <laughs> rapid rapid process to get them to the point they're willing to trust Christ. I like that. You know, microwave witness. That <laughs> yeah, <work>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did yeah, you want yeah. to add anything, Jason? Well, I was just gonna say too, like it it's building relationships too, so you can yeah. I get to know people. You can invite them to dinner. You know, have their family over. Uh, you can be aware of things that are going on even at your church, and you can invite people to you know an event that's going on, you know, yeah. or if you know that they are going through something, then you can point them to a support group kind of thing that's yeah. offered. Um, but I, I'd also want to point out is a few about maybe two months ago we had Julie Chung on, who mm. oversees our workplace ministries here at Saddleback, and um, so you can actually go on saddleback.com/works. Mm. And that's that's their whole ministry is helping people in the workplace. Yeah, that's a good um, one. Glad you remembered that. Yeah, that's great. You guys probably know there's oh I don't know three or four books that have been written in the last few years on Christian hospitality, mm. and the reason for that is we need to recover some of our Christian hospitality in our in our busy world. That the opportunity to be a witness comes like you just said, Jason, out of having a dinner with somebody it doesn't mean you have to invite them over and cook a 10 course meal i mean you can go to in and out together and just hang out for a few minutes Mm. or go into a ball game together or there's something about that that hospitality that's at the core of our faith uh because it says you're welcome Mm. i'm welcoming you into a relationship and that's a reminder that jesus welcomes us all into into a relationship yeah and so it is a theme i'm seeing in a lot of books right now because because i think it's a need Mm -hmm. In, uh, in, in our hearts and our churches. Yeah, that's great. That's so true. Take us on, Jason. I have the next question. 
which is, uh, what if... Because of what the, if? That's I always know. the worst. I know. <laughs> Don't start I'm with ready. what if. I, okay, <laughs> let's this, is, this is a verbatim how we got the okay, question. Okay. This is how the card okay, came to us. I'm yeah. ready. <laughs> it says, what if, because of the circumstances of life, someone never truly hears God's word? Will they go to hell? See, I told you, what if I know. is a terrible, <laughs> is a terrible start. <laughs> Whenever I hear somebody ask that question, The first thing I want to know is, is it personal to you? What's going on in your life? Mm -hmm. And what if questions when it's a cover or a smoke screen? So the first question isn't what if. The question is, well, wait, what about you? Have you heard? Mm -hmm. You know, is this a question about, you know, you hearing or not not Mm -hmm. hearing? Is that what that's about? And uh, I think that's the place to land with that Mm -hmm. because that's what we know. The Bible tells us very clearly that uh, if I've heard about Jesus Christ, and I have rejected that message, and I'm accountable mm-hmm. for that, that, that I'm going to answer to God for that someday. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we can talk about that in, in a way. We say, this is what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. And even as I'm saying it now, I know it makes it feel like, this is why I have a hard time talking about sure. this, like I'm the judge. Mm-hmm. I'm not the judge. You guys aren't the judge. Jesus right. is the judge. Yeah. I, I'm going to stand before him just like anybody else is going to stand before him. But the Bible says... Here's the warning. We're all going to stand before him someday. And he who has the son has the life. He who doesn't have the son doesn't have the life. It's very, very clear. So if you've heard, don't let this thing about, well, maybe somebody else didn't hear be a smoke screen in your mind. You have heard. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. Now, what about the person who hasn't heard? And there's all, you know, what what about the person who lives in the an island? The island. island. <laughs> yeah. And the theoretical. Yeah. Uh, they are still... I know there's some things I don't know, and there's some things I know. Sure. Romans tells us that there's nobody who isn't responsible, that we all are called to account because we've all seen what God has created. Mm. So there is a certain accountability in everybody's heart. Mm. Uh, can they understand from what God has created that Jesus came and died on a cross? I don't know the answer to that. Mm. I don't mm. know the answer to what the Holy Spirit might say to them or how he might reveal things to them. I just know that there is an accountability in everybody's life. Yeah. And I know that for all of us, all God is going to hold us accountable for is the level of uh, what we've heard, but also our ability to respond to that. So Mm. this is really a broader question in many, many ways. Uh, If a baby dies at eight months old, they're going to be in heaven. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Did they get to hear? Mm. Well, maybe somebody told them, but they couldn't understand it as yet. So God's going to hold them accountable as an eight-month-old. Uh, for whatever whatever that means. And as an eight-month-old, there's no accountability for sin. They are safe in the hands of God. And I believe without a shadow of a doubt, they're going to be in eternity for, forever. Hmm. Um, certain mental illnesses or mental handicaps that I might face might cause me to not be able to ever fully comprehend somebody saying that Jesus came to this earth and gave his life. Hmm. That person is also safe, I believe, deeply in the hands of God. Hmm. And... Moving ahead from that, could that mean that somebody on a desert island who didn't ever get to hear the name of Jesus but saw that there was creation and saw that God was benevolent and instead of worshiping themselves uh, and decided to worship somebody that in a way that made them serve others and love others, uh, would that mean that that person might be in heaven? I think there's a chance of that, obviously. Mm. But the Bible doesn't specifically answer it. Yeah, What the Bible does specifically answer is What about the people that lived before Jesus who Mm. didn't hear? Mm. What about Abraham? What about Moses? Well, they're going to be in heaven. First, you know, some of them are on the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, some of those who are going to be. So obviously they're going to be in heaven. Uh, Romans chapter 12 talks about this cloud of witnesses, talking about all the saints from the Old Testament, and and, not Romans, Hebrews chapter 12, about all the cloud of witnesses, talking about Hebrews 11, all those people that were from the Old Testament. So we know that those people are going to be in heaven because they responded to all that God had shown them. Mm. And what he showed them was a sacrificial system. What he showed them was that he's looking forward to something. So they didn't take the sacrificial system as all they needed to trust in. Somehow mm. they knew there was something more, and they were trusting in God, not in the sacrifice. Because mm. he told them to. Yeah. I mean, you, many times in the book of Psalms, are you going to trust in the burnt offering? Are you going to trust in me? What are you going to trust in? Mm. Well, those who trusted in him, maybe through the burnt offering in the Old Testament, uh, are with him forever. 
Mm. So that's a long way to say, I don't know the whole answer to that one. Yeah. How's that? That's Perfect. a great answer. That's great. No. Yeah. It's I, a very deep question that because we don't know the whole answer, sometimes people try to use it as a smoke screen mm -hmm. for their own accountability before God. Yeah. And I think the answer is Old Testament, New Testament, Desert Island, in, in the middle of Manhattan, wherever you are, we all have a certain measure of accountability before yeah. God. Yeah. I think it's it fits with the that this notion of... Um, to whom much is given, much will be required. There's an accountability yes. that's proportional yes. to what you've been given to work yes. with. And you've given us a kind of a picture of the spectrum. I think one of the mistakes we can make with this question is trying to offer a blanket response mm -hmm. to something that deals with a lot of nuance and deals with God's perfect judgment that we cannot emulate. We cannot see each person from God's perspective to that extent. So we can't just lay out a broad brush response to what is really a complex question. Yes, yes. And the, to me, one of the things looking forward to heaven is the surprising grace of God, mm. that there's going to be many, many people in heaven that I wouldn't have let in, <laughs> yeah. that, 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 I, that I didn't think should, should be there. <laughs> you know, I, I think yeah. I should deserve God's grace, but you know, yeah. I, 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 I deeply believe that many people, uh, there are deathbed confessions that we don't know about. Yeah. I deeply believe that because I know what angels do. I know the power of angels, that they mm. show up at the last minute in people's thoughts and minds and experiences. Yeah. And yeah. there were many people we thought, oh, there's no way they were a Christian. I mean, I watched their whole life, right. but something happened at the very end. And the yeah. Bible says, yes, they'll be saved through fire, and there'll be some rewards that they lost, but they will be in eternity with him. Yeah. So we're going to have a lot of surprises because <laughs> yes. of God's grace yeah. in, in, in heaven. C.S. Lewis wrote this book, Surprised by Joy. I think in heaven I'm going to be surprised by grace yeah. again and again and again. Wow, that's, that's great. Cool. And I can say that that is the last what-if question. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. We'll put I, the what-ifs. I looked, that was the last what-if. We'll if. set aside such things. <laughs> good, good. Here, here's one that I uh, that is just a little bit more accessible, I think. Um, besides praying, how can we help bring our adult children back to Christ? Obviously not Jason and I's adult children. But I, well, first, whoever wrote that or is listening to it that has an adult child that's struggling, mm -hmm. wow, I hear your heart. Mm -hmm. um, I have so many friends who their kids are struggling. And, and some are very successful in, in business or in some career and struggling, mm -hmm. um, yet they don't have faith. And so as a parent, you're struggling with them even in the midst of their success. Mm -hmm. Others, uh, maybe they're caught up in a drug addiction and struggling. And uh, the pain of that and their lack of faith in the midst of the addiction they've gotten caught up with is causing a parent to struggle. So there's those two extremes with everything in between. So my heart yeah. deeply goes out to parents who have kids that are struggling. Hmm. Uh, and what I'd say just in a personal way to the parent that's listening first is don't let, don't let Satan become your accuser in this one because he wants to be. He wants hmm. to tell you what you did wrong, what you could have done differently. Hmm. And yeah, you did some things wrong as a parent. So did I. I mean, guess what? We're imperfect human beings, so we're going to yeah. do things wrong as parents. So Satan wants to draw on that and say, if only you had done this, they wouldn't be going through this. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is, once they become an adult, and you know this in your heart, it's their own decision. You, you know there's kids who are brought up by the most wicked and evil of parents, and they're the best, they're the best examples of faith that you can imagine. How yeah. did that happen? <laughs> yeah. Because they made their own decision. Right. And so I think you have to start by not getting on a guilt trip about it. Because mm. if you do, you're not going to be able to do the second thing that's the most important thing in the way that you talk to them. Mm. Uh, and it really goes back to the question we talked about earlier about the person at work and where do you start. We know it starts with love. Yeah, uh, It starts with loving them. And sometimes, I talked about the addiction, it might be tough love. It might be the, the tough love that says you can't live here even anymore if this is the road that you're going down. You're stealing from me. You're, mm -hmm. you're not respecting our home. You're, that's a tough thing for parents to do. And yet that kind of love is what might open the door to them feeling a sense of responsibility that leads to faith. That's mm -hmm. what you pray for. You don't know that that's going to happen, but that's what you pray for. Now, the Bible talks about families, uh, specifically talks about wives witnessing to husbands. But I, I really believe the principle there goes to the entirety of a family and that it's very hard to win a family member with your words. Uh, you, you win a family member with your actions, your actions of love, even if they're tough actions sometimes. Hmm. 
You know, I'm not saying by that that if you've got a kid who's struggling, you have to let them move back in your house and serve them every day. That's not love necessarily. Right. Love is expecting them to live as an adult. Yeah. Now, love is doing the tough things sometimes. And the, but when you do it out of love, they know it. Hmm. If you wait too long, if you think love is, I have to keep them in my home, then eventually you're probably going to kick them out, but not out of love. It's going to be out of frustration and out of bitterness. Hmm. And so that decision to continue to love and serve your family member is the best opportunity. I, I know people who've told me, you know, I had all the arguments there were against Christianity. I, I, I had all this hatred against the church, but my family, they just loved me to Jesus hmm. because no matter what happened, they stuck with me. They were there beside me. They kept loving me through the tough times. They, they never gave up on me. Hmm. And so I, I would say that that, that servant-hearted love is, is, is the key yeah. to our witness to our family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a great key. Mm -hmm. Jason? Um, uh, the next question that we got in says, how do we measure ourselves as genuine believers? And the what Bible if, says yeah. that we are to evaluate ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so... It, the idea of measuring yourself as a genuine believer, I, I like that question because it's not, how do I measure whether others yeah. are genuine believers? Which, wouldn't you agree? That's <laughs> what we all more, want to do, more, yeah. right? You know, <laughs> sure. I would like to, can you give me the checklist? Because yeah. I'm not too sure about this person. You know, they get three out of five, sorry. You know, I've had those thoughts about Doug since <laughs> yeah. Section B, Article 1. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. So how do you measure? I think Jesus gave us the measurement in John 15. You know, if you abide in me, uh, then you'll bear fruit. Mm -hmm. And out of that fruit, you can know that you're my disciple. I mean, he says that's how you can know that. Yeah. So the question in John 15 is, what is the fruit? Uh, some people say the fruit is another Christian. You know, if you win somebody else to Christ, and that's the fruit. Uh, but that's not what Jesus said there, obviously. Right. Uh, the, 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 the one practical thing that Jesus talks about in John 15 is answered prayer. Hmm. He does talk about answered prayer as coming out of our faith. So the fact that God is answering a prayer in your life is one evidence mm -hmm. that you're his child. Uh, I know he doesn't answer every prayer the way that he wanted, want, that we want him to, but he does answer prayer in our lives. So when we feel a sense of peace as we ask for it, when he gives us an answer that we need, when he gives us wisdom that we need, when he leads us to the right place, those are all evidences that you are his child. Mm. Uh, Jesus also talked in John 15 a lot about love and about the command to love. Mm -hmm. So the sense, the deepening sense that you have of God's love for you is another great, great fruit that comes in our lives out of being a follower of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So John 15 is one of the great passages. Jesus said there, uh, if you abide in me, that means to stay connected to me. And you know that in John 15 because just earlier he talked about the branch and the vine. He says, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're the branches, I'm the vine. The vine is the main part uh, uh, of the grape, and the branches are attached, growing out of it. Mm -hmm. And as long as you stay attached to me, that's what it means to abide in me, then you will know the truth, I will set you free, all those things will happen in life. So abiding in Christ, knowing that you have, you're drawing your life from Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, when, as a follower of Christ, when I stop abiding in him, and I start abiding in, I try to draw my life from money, or I try to draw my life from my career, or I try to draw my life from my family, I stop feeling like I'm a Christian. Mm. But the minute I connect again to him, the, all those feelings flood back into my life. Mm. So just the fact that you don't feel Christian doesn't mean that you're not. Mm. The question is, are you connected to him? And if you're connected to him the best you can be connected to him, and you're seeing his fruit in your life, that's strong evidence. The other great evidence is, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, love, yeah. joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If I have those nine qualities in my life growing in some measure, it's an evidence mm -hmm. of the fact that I am in Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, none of us are perfect in those, but the question is, are you more peaceful than you were a year ago? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, maybe maybe three years ago. Let me say it that way. <laughs> Just give you a lot of runway. Yeah. Is something good happening in your life where you feel like, yeah, change is happening. Mm. Yes, it's slower than we want. 
much slower than we want, but it is also more certain than we can imagine mm. because it's going to last all the way into eternity. Mm. So that's what's happening with the the, the fruitfulness of, of seeing what God's doing in my life. Mm. You, it, it it is a matter of feeling. I understand the value of feelings in that, but you can't base it on how you're feeling at the moment, because yeah. the truth is, uh, my my being in Christ. It didn't come about because of my feelings. It came about because of God's promise. Mm. And am I holding on to his promise? Yeah. That's good. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that one. It's such a good question. It's I, I think you covered it really well. You just made me think of something that Pastor Rick tells us all the time, that feelings are important, but they're not necessarily a good reflection of reality all the time. That right. feelings aren't facts, they're feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for us to allow space within our walk with Jesus for our feelings to go through a typical just the typical human ebb and flow. Because as you've said, yes. we are possessed of many, a uh, wide con you know, continuum of emotions that have been given to us by God, um, but that those things can sometimes get away from us and lead us to think things that maybe aren't true or become a lens through which we see things in maybe a slightly uh, warped way. So we might look at ourselves uh, worse than actually God even looks at us right. at, on some level. We often level. do. You're right. Yeah. We often do. There's no condemnation for right. those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. You ever condemned yourself? Oh, gosh. Have yeah. I ever condemned myself? Sure. So yeah. that means I am seeing myself worse in that moment than God says he sees me. Yeah. That's exactly true. Yeah. So I love what you said about grounding our, our, uh, our certainty of salvation in the promises of Christ and not in our very fleeting uh, kind of moment by moment, day to day feelings. Yes. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's the not, root of it. It's not my faith that saves me. Mm. It's my faith in God's promise that saved yeah, me. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. feel like it's my faith, and faith feels like a feeling sometimes. Right. I feel like I have faith. I don't feel like I have. It's not your faith that saved you. Right. It's your faith in God's promise yeah. that saved you. That's what you're standing on. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, I wanted to note, too, Pastor Tom didn't talk about it, but I sure will, <laughs> is Pastor Tom actually has a small group study on John 15. Uh, oh, yeah. So you can uh, check that out if you want to get... Maybe that's why I thought about it, in, yes. Into the vine and the branches. So I just want to say, it, and it's a great one. We'll link it in the show notes for you. You can do it with your small group. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you guys are great. <laughs> Well, friends, I hope that you're enjoying this conversation with Pastor Tom. Uh, we sure are. And we are excited that this conversation is just so exciting, so invigorating, that we're going to make it a two-parter. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're excited about that. So come back next week and hear some more questions, some more answers. And we're just excited to uh, see where it goes. And you know, let me add to that. If you're watching on YouTube especially... Um, Comment below with a question that we haven't covered that you would like to hear answered in the future because we're going to keep doing Q&A episodes like this periodically down the road where we're going to have great guys like Tom on who can help us answer some of these uh, tough and uh, interesting theological questions. So make sure you do that. And if you're listening on the podcast, uh, just send us an email, maturity at saddleback.com. Let us know what your question is. We'd love to answer that in a future episode. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. If you're a podcast listener and you enjoyed this episode, consider giving us a rating or a review on iTunes. If you do, you'll help other people find us in the future. And if you're thinking, hey, listening's great, but is there a way I can watch these episodes? Yeah, there is. Subscribe to the Saddleback Church YouTube channel for video versions of these conversations, plus lots of other video content. And if you're already watching us on YouTube, subscribe to the podcast so you can listen in the car or wherever else you go. Lastly, you can always get in touch with us by emailing maturity at saddleback.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions, your Bible questions, your life questions, whatever. Who knows, your question just might inspire an upcoming episode. Thanks again for tuning in to Doable Discipleship. I'm Doug Jones, and I hope you'll join us again next week.